Welcome to this lecture on the Gospel of John. Uh, this is just an introduction to the Gospel of John. Uh, and John is a pretty fascinating gospel because it is utterly unique in the New Testament. It's, it's even called the fourth gospel, and you'll see me abbreviate the fourth gospel as the number 4G. Uh, scholars do that all the time, uh, but it is completely different in scope uh, in the way Jesus is characterized and just about in every kind of way possible. Uh, the image here that you see is an is a, uh, Ethiopian icon. Um, I don't know how old it is, but you can see this is a depiction of the Gospel of John writing the Gospel in Amharic or uh, Ge'ez, the ancient language of uh, the, the spiritual language of uh, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. Uh, I just I love these icons and uh, found one of John writing. I, I, I put some of them in, in all of our uh, lectures on the Gospel of John. So uh, check them out. Uh, stop the video, uh, zoom in, and, and look at it. It's worth your time. Um, but moving to the fourth Gospel, uh, it's completely different in style. The content is different. The chronology is different. The theology is different. The sociology is different. The Gospel of John is completely different than the Synoptic Gospels. Uh, so this introductory uh, lecture is really going to talk about these main characteristics of the fourth Gospel. Um, every Gospel is associated with a character uh, historically, and John is associated with an eagle. So you get this eagle. This is a, from a... Uh, stained glass window in, in an old church. Um, but some of the most uh, kind of peculiar characteristics of the Gospel of John, if peculiar might not be the right word, um, most notable characteristics that are unique to the Gospel of John is the prologue in chapter 1, 1 through 18. And, and I'm just going to give you a real a quick outline here of what we're going to be talking about in this lecture. The other one is the seven signs. Uh, so Jesus performs miracles in all four of the Gospels. In the Gospel of John, uh, the writer of this Gospel never calls them miracles. He only calls them signs. He did this sign so that X, Y, Z. Uh, so uh, the Gospel of John refers to these mir the miracles that Jesus performs as signs that point to Jesus' identity. Uh, the miracles in the Synoptic Gospels were miraculous and showed that Jesus had the power to do miracles, but it wasn't a sign th that uh, identified something uh, about Jesus. And that's the way the signs, the seven signs in John work. So there are seven miracle stories, and a couple of them are unique to John, but the way John writes about them is very uh, unique to the Gospel of John. The other thing is that there are these long speeches of Jesus that are self-referential. So uh, there are, you know, Jesus does preach in Matthew and Luke. Mark, he really doesn't. Um, yeah, but in Matthew and Luke, he does have extended sermons. But he also tells, he says a lot of parables. There are no parables in the Gospel of John, which is another uh, identifying factor about the Gospel of John. No parables. But Jesus goes on these very, very long speeches. And most of those speeches uh, have to do with Jesus talking about who he is. And uh, it's kind of Jesus revealing himself to people. He does that uh, through several, in several cases, we're in these I am st sayings. Um, and we'll get into this later. But this, this is more than just him saying, hey, this is who I am. I am is specific to uh, the Jewish culture um, in the way they conceptualize God, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, the farewell discourse is unique to the Gospel of John. It's chapters 13 through 17. So there's no um, institution of the Lord's Supper in the Gospel of John, which is you know, a blaring omission. Uh, and so instead of the Last Supper, in, like you have in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, in John you have the Farewell Discourse that lasts for five chapters, um, fundamentally different. 
Uh, the way the Jews is used in the Gospel of John is different than in the other Gospels uh, and has led a lot of scholars to believe that John is anti-Semitic or, at the very least, anti-Jewish. Uh, and, and so this kind of demands that we evaluate uh, the Gospel of John because of that. And finally, the divinity of Jesus. If you read Matthew, if, if we did not have the Gospel of John, the way we conceive of Jesus would fundamentally be different because Jesus is miraculous. Uh, he, he does perform miracles in the Synoptic Gospels, but the Synoptic Gospels never call Jesus God. And so while Jesus does miraculous things and is special and has a special relationship with God in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, None of those Gospels outright declare Jesus to be God. Uh, so the fourth Gospel is uh, really talks about the divinity of Jesus more than the others. Not as much as you may think, but uh, there's some clear evidence in the Gospel of John that um, the, the writer of John is portraying Jesus as divine. So let's get into each one of these main characteristics and uh, look first at the prologue of the Gospel. This is chapters one, uh, chapter one, verses one through eighteen, and it is it sets this gospel apart from all the others. Really, this one section, the prologue, gives the reader, when whoever sits down to read this gospel, that reader uh, gets special information that no one in the narrative of the gospel knows, except for Jesus. So you have this special knowledge about Jesus. Uh, bef that, that none of the characters in the narrative understand. And misunderstanding is a, is a trope in the Gospel of John. So everybody misunderstands except Jesus, except the writer of this Gospel, and except, and except those who read it. So the other readers understand when the characters uh, in the novel don't. Uh, the way the prologue begins in the beginning uh, helps situate this whole Gospel as the new beginning and place and places Jesus within uh, with God at the very creation of time. Uh, that is incredibly important. So this is a um, uh, Genesis, a new Genesis, uh, a, a brand new chapter in um, history. And so what's important is that this is not a birth narrative. Nowhere in the gospel, in the prologue to the gospel of John, is Jesus born. Jesus is not born to parents in the gospel of John, but miraculously becomes flesh in chapter 1, verse 14. Uh, and then in verse 13, you can see that Jesus emphatically is not flesh. And this is a theme that runs throughout the gospel of John, that flesh is evil and spirit is good. And so Jesus... Um, over and over again, is not very fleshy. Uh, Jesus is not portrayed as very human in the Gospel of John. Uh, in fact, uh, Jesus is uh, almost uh, uh, so divine that he's impervious to any kind of human reality. Uh, so this uh, prologue emphasizes Jesus' relationship with God as God the Son in chapter 1, verse 18 rather than the Son of God. So here, this is a, Jesus is a manifestation of God. Uh, from the very beginning of the prologue, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That is an incredible statement um, in early Christianity and um something that's unparalleled in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So the prologue gives you all this information to, to let you know that Jesus was with God at the very beginning of all creation and that Jesus became, miraculously became flesh. Uh, and then when he became flesh, he made his dwelling among uh, human beings. Uh, that is not a birth story. There is no mother and father here. Um, earthly mother and father. There is no birth. Uh, there is, it's completely removed from that kind of human experience. 
so moving from the prologue, let's look at the seven signs. So there are these seven miracles. Uh, the fourth gospel never describes the miracles that Jesus performs as miracles, uh, only uses the terminology of signs. Uh, the miraculous was there um, not to take care of people. Now, this is interesting stuff. Uh, when these miraculous things happened, they, they didn't happen uh, to take care of, you know, the, the wedding feast. It wasn't so much a concern for the bridal party uh, as it was for him to reveal himself, which is his argument with his mom. She says, you, you need to do this. And he goes, no, it's not my time to reveal who I am. And she you know, basically says, you know, you better get this done, boy. Uh, well, uh, that's the nature of the signs in the Gospel of John. The signs weren't so much to help those who needed it, uh, while that that happened, but that was a byproduct of Jesus um, revealing who he was to uh, other human beings. So most scholars believe that the fourth gospel uh, used a source, a written source, that had these specific miracles in it, maybe more, uh, and uh, we call this the signs source, uh, in the same way that Matthew, Mark, Luke, you, Mark, Matthew and Luke used Q, that hypothetical source that we haven't found yet. Uh, we believe that there was a sign source uh, as well that uh, the Gospel of John used when they, he was writing his Gospel. So um, all of the miracles that happen in the Gospel of John occur uh, in the first major section of the narrative of the fourth Gospel. So uh, this is the book of the signs, and, and we'll get into that. And then when I do the outline of the Gospel of John in the next lecture, you'll see, uh, you'll see how that works. Um, so, but this source is lost to history, the sign source. Um, of the seven signs that Jesus performed in the fourth Gospel, four of them are unique to the fourth Gospel, and they do not occur in the synoptic Gospels. And I'll point out those in just a second. Uh, so the other real interesting thing about these seven signs is that they are progressive in their magnitude. The first sign was turning water into wine. While that was significant, um, you know, his next sign is even greater. And the last sign that he performs is resurrecting Lazarus. So it moves from water, you know, this changing water to wine all the way to resurrecting somebody from the dead. So you can see the progressive nature of these signs. So what are these signs? Uh, so the first one is in chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, where Jesus turns water into wine at the wedding in Cana of Galilee. This is unique to the Gospel of John. Uh, the next one is in chapter 4, where he heals the son of the Capernaum official, this is also in Cana of Galilee. Um, chapter 5, the very next chapter, he heals a paralytic at the pool of uh, Beth Zatha. This is unique to the Gospel of John. Uh, feeding of the 5,000 is, is one of these rare stories that's found in all four Gospels. And so uh, this is, must have been a pretty common uh, story here. Him walking on water uh, is also in chapter 6. Healing a man born blind in chapter 9, that is unique to the Gospel of John. It's an extended story. It's a sh sign to, sh to reveal who Jesus is, but it's also a story about how this blind man from birth was the one who was able to really see Jesus for who Jesus was, and all these people who were, were religious leaders who should be able to see things beyond the physical, they were the ones who were blind to Jesus. That's how, that's the nature of that story. So kind of the, the sign was uh, of, uh, this revelation of Jesus, unique to the Gospel of John. And then finally, the raising of Lazarus from the dead in chapter 11. This is also unique to the Gospel of John. Um, it's not found anywhere else in the New Testament. So you see the, the turning of water to wine, the healing of the paralytic, uh, the healing of the man born blind, and then the raising of Lazarus. All, all that is unique to the Gospel of John. And these are the signs 
that point to who Jesus is in, in the Gospel of John. Another important characteristic is these, lo these long self-referential speeches, and they are long. They're chapters long in, in a lot of places. Uh, so there are no parables whatsoever in the Gospel of John. So the parable of the Good Samaritan is not here. The parable of the sheep and goats is not here. The parable of the rich young ruler is not here. The parable of the lost son or the prodigal son is not. None of that's in the Gospel of John. Um, it's only extended speeches that nearly always have Jesus talking about himself. Uh, in many of these extended speeches, we find the iconic I am sayings that we'll get into in a little bit. Uh, the story of Nicodemus, uh, you know, this is where Nicodemus, who is a religious leader, comes to Jesus at night and says, you know, um, ask Jesus, you know, what, how do you become saved? And Jesus talks about uh, being born again, and Nicodemus misunderstands, very typical um, story in the Gospel of John, there's this total misunderstanding. And Jesus says, no, you have to be born again. He's like, well, how can a man enter into his mother's womb? Uh, and there's this long narrative, very long narrative, a whole chapter. And that chapter is followed by the Samaritan woman at the well. Uh, and, and it's another long uh, dialogue that Jesus has with this woman where he's talking about himself, really. I'm going to give you water that gushes up to eternal life. Uh, and she goes, well, the, the well's deep and how you're going to get it. And he goes, you don't know who you're talking to, right? Uh, so, and these are just two examples of these long speeches and dialogues where Jesus reveals important information about himself to others. And many times there's misunderstanding in these stories. Um, but the longest speech and dialogue is the farewell discourse. Um, it's another speech that, that lasts for five chapters. So these, this, from kind of a narrative perspective, this is fundamentally different than the other Gospels. So let's look at these I am statements. Uh, in the fourth Gospel, Jesus uses the phrase I am to refer to himself 46 times. That's incredibly significant. Uh, and to give a, you know, a point of comparison, uh, if you add the synoptic Gospels up together, Matthew, Mark, and Luke only use this phrase nine times. So that is remarkably different uh, in scope. And it's significant in the fourth gospel because it seems to indicate Jesus' divinity and special relationship to God. So in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, this is when Moses had that experience at the burning bush and God told Moses, uh, I am who I am. And then he says, you know, when they ask you who sent me, tell them that I am has sent you. Uh, so this is, um, this is the revelation of God's personal name, Yahweh. Uh, and this is one of the most quintessential moments in the Hebrew Bible, uh, the revelation of God's personal name. And, and it's that, that revelation where God says, I am who I am. Uh, so this is a way that the fourth gospel has Jesus using this phrase um, in, in a way that shows Jesus' divinity and his connection with God. Um, it's really unparalleled. Uh, sus 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 oh, excuse me. Specifically, when Jesus refers to himself as, as I am in the fourth gospel, it seems to be the strongest connection to God's personal name. Uh, and here you can look it up in chapter 8, and chapter 13. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you. Uh, in Greek, it's amen, amen. Uh, very, truly, tr uh, verily, verily. It's basically saying, whenever you see that in the New Testament, especially in the Gospel of John, it's almost like saying, listen up. Jesus is about to say something important. Uh, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was... I am. Uh, incredibly important uh, part of the Gospel of John, these I am statements. So let's uh, look at them a little bit more. Uh, the seven symbolic I am statements um, come from here in chapter 6. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate, and this is the gate through which the sheep enter. Right? I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. 
I am the way, the truth, and the life. None of this is in the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, or Luke. And then finally, I am the true vine. Every one of these, he's revealing something about himself, and almost all of these are couched in a very long speech. So let's talk about one of those speeches, uh, the farewell discourse. Uh, it encompasses a full five chapters, chapter 13 through 17. Uh, and this is an extended speech and dialogue where Jesus uh, describes his departure or death. He's telling the disciples, I'm, I'm about to leave you. Uh, and he tells them how they need to behave with each other and with the world after he's gone. So he's giving them instructions uh, on how to exist in his absence. And that's, that's why it's called the Farewell Discourse. Uh, the structure of this discourse is intentional, and it shows the reader how in control the whole situation Jesus is and how he's preparing his disciples for his death. In other words, uh, Jesus knows already in these five chapters what's about to happen to him, and he's preparing his disciples for it. He's not really preparing himself. He's in complete control throughout the Gospel of John, which is another indication of how his divinity is uh, emphasized. So uh, let's look at how the farewell discourse is outlined. And in the outline, you'll see how important the structure is. So chapter 13, he says, serve each other. And this is uh, unique to the Gospel of John. It's found nowhere else in the Bible. It's where Jesus washes the disciples' feet. And he says, you know, you should do each other. You should do this to each other. If I'm going to wash your feet, how much more should you wash each other's feet? So serve each other. And then he gives this word about departure in chapter 14. And this is very quotable stuff, right? I'm going to go to a place uh, that I'm preparing for you, but you can't go. Um, and then one of the disciples says, well, if, if, uh, if we can't go, how are we supposed to know the way? And this is where Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So there's this word of departure followed by another teaching on staying together. So that first teaching was, uh, you know, serve each other, and then he's leaving. And then he says, stay connected, uh, abide in me, and I in you. So here's this interconnection between uh, the disciples and Jesus. And as soon as he says that, again, it gets into another word of departure, chapter 16, and it ends with, you know, um, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Again, preparing them uh, with this word of departure, followed by stay united. And this is where Jesus prays that the disciples will stay together as one, uh, just like he and the Father are one. Again, emphasizing his uh, um, divinity at some level. But you see how the structure of the farewell discourse works you serve each other, word of departure. Stay connected, word of departure. Stay united. So throughout this whole thing, Jesus is preparing them uh, to care for each other, to, to continue to stay connected with him, and then to stay connected with each other um, just the way Jesus and God was as he leaves. So farewell discourse is a major part of the Gospel of John. Um, as you read through it, pay real close attention to how it's structured and uh, and listen to how uh, the whole mood of the gospel really shifts in chapter 13. Now, I do want to spend some time talking about uh, the way the gospel of John uses the Jews in, uh, in, in the characters, um, in, in the way it's characterized in the gospel of John. Um, it is a trope, it's, it's a hot term, um, but there's a lot of questions about it. So, the Jews in the fourth gospel, they, this is a stock phrase just for enemies. It's seldom used in a positive way in spite of the fact that Jesus and his disciples are Jews and are portrayed as Jews in the fourth gospel. Uh, so there is this kind of weird thing that's going on that's kind of indicating something for us. Jesus is Jewish. His disciples are Jewish. So when, when the Jews are mentioned, is it is it something external to the disciples in Jesus? Uh, it, it kind of begs that question. So how do we explain this anti-Jewish sentiment as the same, and at the same time understand Jesus and his follower, followers as Jews? 
Uh, this uh, is the window into the Joanine community. And the Joanine community is the community that produced the Gospel of John and the Epistles of John. It's in this community uh, that we get these writings. And the way this community has Jesus talking about the Jews, it tells us that this community was most likely a Jewish community, just like Jesus and his disciples. Uh, that had been ostracized from the larger Jewish community due to their belief in Jesus. And so this, this community um, uh, gets kicked out of the Jewish, larger Jewish community uh, because of the way they believe in Jesus. And it's in that reaction to being kicked out that the Gospel of John is written to kind of explain the, their existence in the world. This is how a group of Jews... Uh, ends up being in exile from another group of Jews. Uh, the Gospel of John gives um, rationale for that. So uh, pay close attention to how Ehrman de describes this community on pages 182 through 189. It's very important. I think he does a really good job kind of delineating the, the problem. So uh, in this case, uh, the Jews are the specific Jews who excluded the Joanian community uh, and is indicative of an inner Jewish polemic. So um, the Joanian community was a Jewish community. It was exiled from the Jewish community. So it's an inner Jewish polemic. All right, so let's kind of round this out with uh, talking about the divinity of Jesus. The Gospel of John portrays the most divine Jesus than anywhere else in the New Testament. The letter to the Hebrews, the God, that, that might have some pretty high Christological statements. There's this one passage in, in Philippians that's pretty high, but the Gospel of John really does. It have the highest Christology in the New Testament, I think. Uh, the I am statements clearly position J Jesus as divine, kind of co-opting the, the divine name of God. The authority that Jesus has uh, in the seven signs, all the, they are signs because they signify Jesus' divinity. Uh, the portrayal of Jesus' uh, crucifixion show him in absolute control throughout the whole process, uh, indicating his divinity. Uh, specific passages explicitly cite Jesus' identity, and we'll look at some of those. Uh, we already did, really, uh, chapter 1 in the prologue, verses 1 and verses 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That is a pretty strong equation between the Word and God. And who is the Word? In verse 14, it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father. So this, this is Jesus. Jesus is the Word. Uh, John chapter 10, um, the fourth gospel has Jesus saying, I and the Father are one. And then finally, Thomas confessed at the very end, uh, and, and says this, uh, my Lord and my God, he calls out uh, to the resurrected Christ. So these are pretty clearly um, passages that, that speak to the divinity of Jesus, uh, and they're all important uh, to kind of construct who this Jesus is. And I leave you with this because this is the, the original ending of John. John chapter 21 is an epilogue that was probably added later. And these are the last, uh, and this is really the theme of the whole G gospel. Uh, now, Jesus did many other signs, again, that word signs, in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these, the seven signs, are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and through believing, you may have life in his name. Uh, so that is... Uh, those are the high points in the Gospel of John. There are more, and you can write a book on every one of those main characteristics, uh, but we have to 
um, kind of pick and choose as we teach these classes. Uh, the next lecture is just going to basically go in through an outline of the Gospel of John. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to send me an email.